Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our gospel service online. You're very welcome, and I trust you'll be blessed tonight as you hear from God's word. So thank you for being with us this evening. Turn with me to Mark's gospel again. We're continu continuing our studies in Mark, in Mark chapter 9, and we come to another uh, great passage for us to consider this evening. And this is the day after uh, the transfiguration whenever Jesus and the disciples were coming down the mountain so let's pick up the story from verse 14 this is the word of God Mark 9 verse 14 and when he came to his disciples he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them and immediately remember this is Mark's favourite word immediately when they had saw him all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he, Jesus, asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I, I brought you my son who has a, a mute spirit. And, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And so he spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out but they could not and he answered him and said O faithless generation how long shall I be with you how long shall I bear with you bring him to me verse 20 then they brought him to him to the Lord Jesus and when Jesus saw him immediately the spirit convulsed him and, and, he, and he fell to the, on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth and so he asked his father how long has this been happening to him and he said from childhood and often he, he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him but if you can do anything have compassion on us and help us Jesus said to him if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes Verse 24, immediately, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my own belief. And when Jesus saw that the people were running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and, and came out of him and he became as one dead. So that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him, asked Jesus privately, why could we not cast it out? That is the, 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 the demon. And so Jesus said to them, this kind can, can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting well we pray that God will bless the reading of his precious word let's pray together let's seek the Lord and ask for his help and his blessing this evening our father in heaven we thank you that we can come before you again this day we thank you that this is your day the Lord's day and even though we've had to meet online all day and, and next week as well, we thank you for this public forum, for, for Facebook Live, for YouTube, and so and another, and other outlets that we can use to proclaim the gospel, to spread the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as your word goes forth tonight, as your word has went forth this morning and all day around your world, uh, Lord, I pray that you will that you will bring uh, forth uh, salvation, that you will bring uh, uh, godliness and fruitfulness, and Lord, that you will build your church this day. And so, Lord, thank you for the that we can read your word publicly like this. We can proclaim it publicly. We can uh, preach it. We can uh, study it and, and declare it. And so, Lord, thank you for the freedoms that we have. And Lord, help us never to take those for granted. And Lord, may we use, may we use these these um, 
these opportunities. May we redeem the time that we have because the night is first spent and the day is at hand and the coming of Christ is at hand. And so, Lord, we, we pray tonight that as your word goes forth, that you would open blinded eyes, that you would, that you would um, open deafened ears, ha uh, soften hardened hearts, and Lord, I pray that you would, that you, Lord, I pray that you would grant us faith tonight, help us to believe, um, and, and help help us in our unbelief. We confess at times we do lack the faith to believe. We, we do not trust you as we ought. We do not walk with you as we should. Uh, and so, Lord, forgive us tonight. Uh, and I pray that you would help us to, to, to truly see who you are and to embrace you and to seek your face and to ask for your help uh, so, that, so that you can deliver us and, and save us from our sins, save us from, from ourselves. And save us from this godless, sinful world. And so, Lord, we, we, we pray tonight that you would do a mighty work in our midst. Help me, I pray, Lord, as I come, uh, as I preach your word. I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross, and uh, speak through me and use me for your great name's sake. So, Lord, be with us now. Thank you for our church family. We commit them to you, and Lord, we pray your blessing upon them. For it's in your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Nobel Prize winner, Professor Francis Crick, was also a molecular biologist. And in 1953, along with his friend James Watson, they discovered something amazing. And they wrote a letter, uh, or a paper, on the double helix structure of DNA. So you can imagine this was a massive discovery. Well, in 1994, some years later, Francis was interviewed by the Times newspaper. And in that interview, he suggested there might be a religious gene in us. Can you imagine? He thought, now listen to this, he thought there might be something in some people's brains uh, which made them more susceptible to religion, to faith. He said, quote, some may be prone to having faith due to this gene. What a load of baloney. But then consider Professor Richard Dawkins um, and, and what he said. Um, he, he said. He said this, that religion is a mental virus. Now, of course, we're living in a world of viruses today, aren't we? And he's saying that religion is a mental virus, a false belief, he says, which infects the mind the way a virus infects the body. Can you imagine? He states to this day that God does not exist. And so he wrote a book on it, The God Delusion. Because he says in that book that belief in a personal God qualifies as a delusion. We're deluded to believe in God. He also says that faith in God is not based on evidence. It is, quote, one of the world's great evils. That I don't know how that makes you feel, but... That's so sad. Here's these two men on top of their on top of their field, professors, intelligent, intelligent men, and they're talking dribble. Absolute garbage, if you don't mind me saying. And the sad thing, the sad thing here is that in both these cases, they assume that the nature of faith is some irrational disposition. Whether it's genetical or environmental, the one question that that these two men um, never thought of asking, or at least certainly didn't pen it anyway, didn't put it down on paper, is this. Is it true? What people believe about God, is it true? What makes a person believe in God? Let me try and... Let me try and illustrate it this way. Whenever you were young, free and single, okay? So back to your late teens, maybe your early 20s. So imagine you're back in your, 20, your, your late teens, early 20s, and a friend said to you, have you ever thought about uh, such and such a person? Um, I think, I think they, they're right for you. They're, 
Uh, he or she is beautiful, uh, attractive, and I think you've a lot in common. And you may agree with them. You may agree with that person and, and believe what they say is true. But whenever you actually see uh, the person that they were talking about in person, close up, and you get to know that person over the days and weeks and months to come, you are absolutely blown away and you're left speechless, speechless, breathless. They, every time you see that person, they, they take your breath away. Now, what happened? Did you receive new information that, that, that made you act that way and feel that way? No. No, the difference is, or the difference was, that you now get to experience what you already knew to be true. You get to experience it. That's the difference. Well, Mark, in his gospel, and like the other three gospel writers, uh, Mark has taken the time to write down all the eyewitness accounts, all the evidence which is centered uh, on the on the person of of Jesus Christ. Mark wants his readers, you and I, to see the significance, the importance of this man who claims to be the Son of God and the rightful King. Mark wants us to truly see him to see his majesty, to see his glory and experience his salvation so that we will follow him, so that we will become a disciple of, of the Lord Jesus. At the beginning of, of his public ministry, remember, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. And so this is how we can have faith today. By believing in the person of Christ and in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Take what Jesus said in um, Matthew 11. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, or are burdened, and I will give you rest. Right? We, we know this verse. We love this verse. But notice what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, come to me or come unto me, all you who are genetically inclined. Okay, all you who have the faith gene or the religious gene and I will give you rest. No, the call, the invitation is for all who are weary and burdened of their sins. And then the promise is, I will give you rest. I will save you. And so the good news of the gospel is for sinners who know they, they need a saviour. In the early 16th century, uh, Raphael painted, some would say, his greatest piece of art. It turned out to be his last piece, in fact, because he died at the age of 37. And the painting was entitled The Transfiguration. I think it's it's hanging up in, in, in Vatican um, uh, to this day. Well, if you uh, Google uh, uh, Raphael's painting uh, of the Transfiguration, you will see it's in three stages, three parts. The first part or the first half, the top half, if you like, is, is of Jesus uh, being transfigured with Moses to his left and Elijah on the right. And then you can see the three disciples, Peter, James and John, and they're shielding their eyes from the brilliance that is shining from the Lord Jesus. And then in the lower half of the painting uh, features um, the other disciples with this poor demon-possessed boy and his father. I think Raphael captured the uh, um, whether he intentionally did that, I don't know, but he, he, he captured beautifully the, the contrast between the majesty of the Lord, the, the, the glory of, of the Lord on the holy mountain, while down below is a troubled wor world uh, waiting to be rescued. And I think this is what Mark wants us to see here in this passage before us. 
It is now the next day as Jesus and the three made their way back down Mount Hermon. Peter, James and John were still uh, thinking about what took place. Um, they got to witness the glory of God in human form, the, the majesty of Christ. They were able to see a glimpse of his divinity shined through and Jesus was changed, um, bef uh, transfigured before them. They also, remember, got to see Moses and Elijah. You know, over a thousand years later, uh, and here is these two men, and they're they're alive. Um, they're not ghosts. They're 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 a, a, as much alive as you and I are this evening. They're real, and they're standing talking to Jesus on the on Mount Hermon on this holy mount, and 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 they're showing, they're showing these three disciples that Jesus is greater than them. He is greater than Moses. He is greater than Elijah. He is greater than, than these giants, these men of faith. Why? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And then the three, remember, got to experience the Shekinah glory of God as, as, as the Father came, came over them and around them in the cloud. And, and they got to hear the voice of God saying this, is my beloved son. Hear him. And so we want to hear from him again this evening, don't we? This was a life-changing moment for uh, Peter, James and John. An event that, that they would never, ever, ever forget the rest of their lives. But as soon as they come down from the holy mountain, Mark tells us a great multitude, a great crowd now surrounded them the scribes and the teachers the teachers of the law were disputing they were arguing with one another and they were arguing with the crowd this multitude and the other disciples that were left at the bottom of the mountain and 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 then we see this demon possessed boy and his father and they were there looking for jesus so that he would help them have compassion on them and so having, having had this real uh, mountaintop experience with God to now experience the valley of chaos and sin and brokenness and helplessness and, and unbelief even. Um, and, and that's what Mark wants us to see here. The contrast between the mountaintop and the valley, between the highs and the lows. The good times and the bad times. Well, as I thought about um, this passage this evening, as I thought about the contrast that Raphael tried to capture in his painting and, and what Mark is trying to capture here in his gospel, isn't life just like, just like what we have said? Isn't life just like that for us? One day we can be on the, on the mountain worshipping God, experiencing uh, uh, fellowship with him. As we read the scriptures and pray, he speaks to us. He, he, he reveals himself to us, teaching us something new about his character. And we feel, we, we feel the nearness and the intimacy of the Lord in a very special way. And then the next day, the next day we can be in the valley and when trouble strikes, when trouble comes, you're called maybe in, uh, in to see the boss and he tells you, you you've no job. You receive a phone call from the hospital to say you have cancer. You get a knock on the front door and two police officers are standing there and they say to you, we are so sorry to have to tell you, your husband is dead. Your father is dead. Your child has died. Can you please come with us? And now your world comes crashing in all around you. And you're in the darkness. And the light is dimmering. The light is flickering. 
and you're trying to you're trying to hold on to the Lord. You're trying to find God in the midst of the chaos. And it's hard. Life shows us, doesn't it? Again and again. Just how weak and fragile we are. Just how temporal this, uh, this world is. It shows us, certainly from this story, that in order to make sense of life, in order to make sense of our world and so on and so forth, in order to be rescued and saved from this broken, fallen world, full of chaos and sin, then we need the Lord Jesus. We need to put our faith in him. We need to, to keep trusting him day by day. Even when it doesn't make sense, we need to keep trusting him. If you're a parent tonight, can you imagine being in this father's shoes? The father of this demon-possessed boy. Watching your son day after day um, go into fits, shaking uncontrollably on the floor, um, not never been able to speak, but always foaming at the mouth because of a demon possessing um, uh, your son. It's awful. It's it's an awful scene, isn't it? It's a, it's a picture of of just how broken and how how fallen our world is. This is not how God intended our world to be but because of sin this is the this is the result of 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 our rebellion against the lord in the garden of eden well can you can you see the desperation in in this father here he clearly loves his son he clearly is concerned about his son but yet notice in his desperation he is absolutely powerless to help his son. He cannot save his son. No matter what he does, all he could do was uh, be there for his boy whenever the demon tried to destroy his son's body, either by fire or by water. We see here that even the disciples who were waiting on the Lord, they too were powerless to deliver this young boy. And so what Mark wants us to see here, what Jesus walked into, was total unbelief. Total unbelief. That's what we see here. That's what the Lord Jesus walked into as he came down the mountain. Plain and simple. Nothing but unbelief. Verse 19. What does he say? Oh, faithless generation. As he looked around... Uh, it, all I could see was faithlessness, unbelief. Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? He says, bring him to me. Well, four things very quickly this evening. The first is this. Jesus saw unbelief in the scribes. Unbelief in the scribes. These teachers of the law who knew the Old Testament scriptures, who knew the law inside and out, should have known better. Jesus should have found faith in them, but he didn't. Instead, he found unbelief. There, they, were, they were only there, like before, like every other time, to gather information about Jesus and the disciples so that they could use it against him. And that's why we find them arguing with one another, disputing with one another and the crowd and the disciples. Doesn't this tell us this evening that you can be the most religious person on planet Earth? You can be a, even a God-fearing person tonight. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, according to the Bible, according to to the, the Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only key that will unlock the gates of heaven. Faith is the only way you and I will ever get to spend eternity with God. And so the first thing that Jesus saw here was unbelief 
in the scribes. Secondly, Jesus saw unbelief in the disciples. They too were unable to cast out the demon from the boy, remember. Even though back in chapter 6, Jesus had given the disciples authority. He had sent them out and given them authority to heal the sick and to, yes, you guessed it, cast out demons. And and up until this point, they were they were they were good. They were a hundred percent every time. They were casting out demons. So so what what was wrong this time? What what went wrong? Well, what did Jesus say? Well, what did the disciples say? Verse twenty eight. And then Jesus and when Jesus had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out, cast out the demon? Verse 29, so Jesus said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but only prayer and fasting. And so Jesus saw unbelief in his disciples in the sense that he saw a serious lack of faith in them. The problem, you see, with the disciples was they had stopped relying on the Lord. That's that's what we see here. They had stopped relying on the Lord um, and, and they were relying now on themselves, on their own authority, on their own abilities. And this grieved the Lord. It grieved the Lord greatly. What a lesson for the church today, is this not? A lesson for pastors, ministers, elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, worship leaders, and on and on and on we can go. For us all, what a lesson for us. I think I think we are powerless today, at least a lot of the time, because we are not exercising faith in the Lord. We are too independent. We're serving the Lord on, in our own strength, reliant in our own gifts, in our own abilities, in our own talents. And we're not coming to the Lord. It means, sadly, we too often make ministry and service about us instead about the Lord, instead of humbly coming uh, before him and saying, Lord, we need your help here. I, I, I need your help uh, so that I may serve you faithfully, so that I may please you and honour you with all that I say and all that I do. I think also we fall into the trap, certainly here in the West anyway, the trap that if we throw enough money at something or we throw enough people at a, at a project, then it will be successful. Surely God will bless this, we say. How could he not? And so we pray. We even pray in Jesus' name. But the problem still is we have made everything about us. We want the power for ourselves. We want the blessing for ourselves or for our church, for our own church. We want all the glory to come to, to, to us. We never stop to ask, well, what does the Lord want us to do here? We're always putting the cart before the horse. We're never coming to the Lord and saying, how, how can we best magnify your, you, O oh God? How can we best glorify your name? What is it, what is your will uh, for us in this? And I think this is, this is why we, we don't see a lot of blessing, certainly here in the West today. Because we're not dependent upon the Lord. We're not exercising faith in him. So Jesus saw unbelief in the scribes. He then saw unbelief in the disciples, or at least a lack of a serious lack of faith. And then thirdly, he saw unbelief in the people, in this multitude, this great multitude that 
that, that was around them. Verse 25, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, um, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. It's interesting, at the beginning, um, uh, at the beginning, Mark, Mark told us, verse 15, that immediately, immediately, when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. On the one hand, the crowd were amazed again. They, they couldn't wait to see the Lord Jesus. They, they, uh, they, they couldn't wait to hear from him. They couldn't wait to be in his presence again, running to him uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But yet on the other hand, whenever Jesus performed a miracle, th this miracle of, of casting out the demon from the boy, which they saw, remember, they saw with their own eyes. How did the people react? Did they, did they, did they, were they amazed at the Lord Jesus, at this wonderful miracle? Did they believe in the Lord Jesus? Verse 26, no, they didn't. When they saw the still body, they said, he is dead. And so Jesus saw unbelief in the people. Surely this is one of the most disappointing responses to Jesus which we find. What does this tell us? I think it tells us this, that it is not enough for us to be amazed at the Lord Jesus. It's not enough. Enthusiasm is not the same as faith. There are many enthusiastic people in the church but we see very little faith today. And I think this is why Jesus said to the Father, verse 23, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And so now, finally, Jesus saw not unbelief, but faith. Genuine faith now in the Father. Verse 24, immediately the Father of the child cried out, and said with tears, tears tripping him, tears running down his face, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The father here believed because he saw the compassion of Jesus, verse 22. He saw the heart of Jesus. He saw the caring nature of the Lord Jesus here. And he believed that Jesus was the only one who could save his son. Lord, I believe, he said. What a wonderful picture of saving faith. And so, dear friends, this is what we need today. We need faith. The Father here, he put his trust in uh, two things. One, in remember we said at the very beginning, in the person of Christ, who he is. And he put his trust in the work of Christ, what he could do. Friends, this is what you need to do tonight in order to be saved. You've heard the evidence. You've witnessed the miracle from God's word. And now you need to put your trust in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. His finished work that was accomplished on Calvary's cross. You need to come to him in repentance and faith. The one who died on the cross for you. The one who came to take away all of your sins and to give you everlasting life so that you can spend eternity with God forever. And so, and so this, this, dear friends, is what you need to do right now in order to be saved. Is Jesus, is Jesus going, to see, going to see unbelief in you again tonight? Is that what he's going to see in your heart, in your life, and how you live? Or is he going to see faith? Genuine faith. Saving faith. And loved ones, let me say this to you tonight. If we are truly going to see the power of God once again in our churches and in our homes and in our country, in our world, 
then let's throw ourselves upon his mercy. Let's ask for his forgiveness and seek us and seek um, his face so that he might help us. We need a mighty work of the Spirit to come, don't we? Not for ourselves, but we need a mighty work of, of the Spirit to come for the glory of God. For the glory of Christ Jesus. So that the gospel might advance. So that the kingdom of God might grow in people's hearts and lives. And be established. So that, so that the Lord can build his church. We need a mighty work. That his will would be done. And so let us come before him. Not only in mercy, not only seeking his face for help, but let us come before him in prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Isn't that what Jesus said to his disciples in private? Stop relying on yourself. Stop being so independent, Jesus says. I'm a faith. Put your trust in me. And so let's come before him in prayer and fasting and seek his face and seek his help, seek his blessing, not for ourselves, but for the sake of his name. When our world falls apart, whenever we're in the midst of darkness and chaos and we're struggling to make sense of it all, cry out to him with tears running down your face. Don't be afraid of tears. Cry out to him, have mercy on us and help us. Lord, help my unbelief, just like this father did. Cry unto the Lord tonight. Put your trust in the Lord, because all things, Jesus says, are possible to those who believe. And so do you believe tonight? Do you truly believe? Let me finish with the words of the psalmist in Psalm 34, 17 and 18. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Amen. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves those who have a contrite spirit. Amen. And so I pray tonight, I pray that you will cry unto the Lord so that he can deliver you from whatever trouble you're facing. And know tonight that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he's able to save those who humble themselves, those who have a contrite spirit. Well, we're going to sing together. In fact, Joanne is going to lead us in this beautiful, simple, little, little song, Wonderful Grace. Listen to the words. If you know it, sing along in your homes. Sing to the glory and praise of God. Wonderful Grace. We have a wonderful Saviour tonight who loves you, who died for you. And you can cry out to him tonight. Cry out to him in faith and put your trust in him. And he will save you and keep you for all eternity. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, as the voice of man grows silent now, as we sing, our, as we sing this closing piece, Wonderful Grace, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love tonight. We thank you that you are a compassionate God, a God who cares for us. A God who hears us. A God who sees us in our troubles. In the midst of darkness. In the midst of, of this fallen, broken, sinful world. You see us. And you're the God who is able to deliver us. The God who is able to save us. To the uttermost. You're the God who is able to keep us. Not only, for, not only today. Not only now. But you're able to keep us and sustain us for all eternity. 
And this is why we can put our trust in you. This is why we can come into your presence with fear. Because we've experienced um, the gospel. We have witnessed uh, your, your grace, your mercy, your love. We thank you for who you are, Lord. You are the Son of Man. You are the Son of God. You are the, the Saviour of the world. You are the rightful King of our lives. And so we humble ourselves before you. We lay our lives at your feet. And we say, Lord God, live in me. Live in us. Save us. And help us, we pray. And so, Lord, thank you for thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for another opportunity to hear the good news, the gospel. And so, Lord, help us in our own belief tonight. Give us faith to believe. And help us to fix our eyes on you. To follow you. To trust you. For it's in your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for being with us. And uh, Take care. Stay safe. Have a good week. Good night. Wonderful grace that gives what I